Oh, there we go. There's a blue light. Is it continuing to flash? And it's continuing to flash. So I think we're good. We're live. We're running. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to my session, sort of titled Delegated Tooling with PowerShell. When I initially proposed this session, I had one thing in mind. And then as I started working, I thought, well, this isn't going to quite get where I want it to be. Um, although we will get to some GIA stuff here at the end. Now, my name, by the way, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff Hicks. Uh, I'm a longtime PowerShell MVP, author, trainer, consultant. I'm now a contributing editor for Petri. Uh, pretty much everything that I write now online, that's where you'll find it. So PowerShell content, and I'm cranking out lots of stuff. I'm active, very active on Twitter and Google Plus and in the Facebook community for PowerShell. And you can also find me on my blog. Uh, as I mentioned before, as some of you who didn't hear this, everything I'm going to show you, all my demos, uh, I will share. They'll probably be on my blog. I'll tweet about it. So make sure you are following me. So the challenge here, and why I'm assuming that a lot of you are here, is we all do things as IT pros. And my, I work primarily with IT pros. That's my community. I've got people who want to know, what is this PowerShell thing? How do I use it to do my job? If that's you, you're in the right session. So what, as IT pros, you know, we, yeah, we've got the keys to the kingdom. We can do everything. But we don't want to have to do everything. There may be certain tasks that you want to delegate. It may be something that you want to give to, I hate to say a junior admin, but someone lower on the food chain, or an intern, or even to delegate to a non-IT user. You want to give. You know, we used to do this in Active Directory all the time. I want to give, you know, the, the secretary the ability to clear print queues. So the department print server, boom. She deals with it. I no longer have to take those calls. <coughs> PowerShell is a great tool for doing a lot of things. But we want to be able to have a way to delegate a, some task that we're going to solve with PowerShell. But we need to make sure we're not giving them everything or not, we don't want to give them the keys of the kingdom, right? We need to delegate, and how do we delegate that? And so that's the first question you have to ask. Part of my talk here, the slide here, I only have a couple slides, is a kind of a processing. Who are you delegating to? Is it someone with IT experience, with some PowerShell experience? What expectations will they have with how they interact with your tool? Did it come out the way I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> as you, as as we go through my demos, you're going to see I kind of have a continuum of tools where we're going to start with command line and go into GUI stuff and whatever. So who are you going to delegate to? What is their expectations of how they will use whatever it is that you're giving them? How much will they know? Because <coughs> once you delegate, you don't want to be answering a call. Okay, how do I do this again? I think <coughs> I'm getting this error. What does this mean? Right. So you got to think about. Who's going to use your script, your, your tool, your GUI, whatever it is that you're building? A lot of stuff we do with PowerShell has dependencies, right? I may need certain modules or commands for module or a provider. Maybe I need to have some remoting built in. So what kind of things will that person have access to in order to do their job? Or to do the job with the tool that you're going to, to create? And, you know, and what do you want them to have access to? Yeah, you could make sure that they have the Active Directory module installed in their computer, but then they have access to all of the commandlets and all of the parameters. And if they have the right credentials, which they may need for the task that you're doing, they have access to maybe more than you want them to do. That's where the G part will come in later. Although it doesn't, you don't have to wait for that, as I'm going to hopefully show you. And that's the demo part. So that was it for slides. Any questions so far? So when you're thinking about delegating, who am I giving this to? What can I expect them to do? And what do they need to do that job? Okay? Kind of have to keep those, have to answer those three questions even before you get to the demo, to what I'm going to show you. So I'm going to kind of show you a continuum of delegation, if you will. The example I'm using is 
And the solutions I have here really are just proof of concept, not something I would say, oh, take this and run this in production, okay? I will share everything with you, but think of this more as con concept as opposed to a final finished product. So with that, I'm going to jump over and we can see the IC, good. So I started with a simple PowerShell script. And actually to make this interesting, I'm running this on, a, on my laptop, which is not a member of my Active Directory domain, which I'm hosting on my little Hyper-V box here. I've set things up so that I have credentials that will automatically pass. To, to save that, but I'm not even a part of the actual domain. So I built a script that will prompt a, the person running this for some part of the user SAM account name. It will then retrieve that account from Active Directory, but it's going to search in the, limited to searching in the employee's OU. <coughs> I'm also going to only show a few properties. I'm just show you, because this is the, the key part that all of my steps are going to basically build from. Because I might get multiple users back, I then get a little table, I can pick the, the user I want and then set a new password. And I also will go ahead and flag them to change password at next logon. It's very important that when you are building any sort of tool, especially when you start getting, thinking, oh, I want to build a GUI around this, that you have something that works from the console perfectly. Don't try to build your GUI tool and your underlying PowerShell commands at the same time. You're just gonna make your life miserable. Start with something that works from the console and then we build a GUI on top of that and you're gonna see how that works. If I were to run this, and this is just a script, so there's my prompt and let's say I want to find everyone that has Frost in the name. Emma? <clears throat> Always nervous when I run these from not at home because I just have my little test network and I don't know if it's always going to work. Okay, so now I built dynamic, built a menu, and I want to change uh, number four, Jack Frost. So I'm just going to put that in putting in a new password. And it's now updating the account in Active Directory. Obviously, I'm not in a production quality environment here, which is why this seems to take a little bit. So, but this will work. So what I have here is a known working <coughs> script. I could give this to the help desk as long as they have access to the requirements for the script, keep biting my tongue, which would be the Active Directory module. So if they have the Active Directory module, they could run the script, but right, they've got then access to everything, even though I'm kind of limiting what properties are returned back, that is, the reason I have that is once I make the change, then I go and retrieve the user account with some additional properties. Well, actually, I use the properties up here so I can make sure I could try to identify the right user account. And there are probably better ways that you, other tools that you could use for this. Don't focus on, oh, there's a better way to change password. This just happens to be the task that I chose, okay? So I have a script that works, but I want to, I, I can delegate that if I wanted to. Maybe what I want to do is build a GUI. Here is the final product. Um, let's find people with MA in the name. So you're saying this is an searching. example of a tool that you want to give to somebody else to do? And yes, kind of right. Free some bandwidth? Right. So what I can do now is, while this is searching here, I built <laughs> this. I'll bring up, I, I use PowerShell Studio. You can use whatever mechanism you want to build your GUI. I've used WinForms, you want to build something with WPF, you can, but it doesn't matter. 
But I basically took the same code that already worked and put that in my form. So the nice thing for me about using PowerShell Studio is it makes it really easy to build a GUI so I can focus on the code that runs behind it. So I basically took some of the variables that limited what I wanted to connect to. In my case, for the sake of my demo, I need to make sure that I always talk to uh, DC4. The property is the OU. <clears throat> and then the code here for the click button is basically the same code that's in my script. Having to make adjustments to pull the values from the graphical elements. And the nice thing about PowerShell Studio is I can turn that into an executable. So now I can just give that to the help desk. Now they still need to have the Active Directory module installed. So that's a potential issue. Because it's still using get AD user and all those commandlets. But they don't have to try to type anything. They don't have to try to open up a prompt and know what to type. They can just click the icon on their desktop. That will pop up. They can come here and say, oh yeah, I need to change Buford Ellerin. Put in a new password, so I probably screwed up. Click update. It updates it and then refreshes it and gives me the new version <clears throat> of his user account. Come in. Which will show me one thing I included was the uh, password last set. It should show zero, which tells me that it was successful. So that's somewhat useful. Again, the user would have to have the underlying code there. That eh, something didn't quite work right there, but you get the idea. I would have expected to get the user account back. So let's just exit out of that. Any questions so far? I'm sorry. I'm seeing rights delegation here or just function? Just function. Okay. Now, yeah, because I'm doing Active Directory, yeah, there are things you could do in Active Directory itself to do delegation, right? You can delegate an OU. So I, and, and that, you, you know, for this particular task, that might be part of it as well. So the, the user that is running this, I'm assuming, already has the right credentials to update the user account. So th this is like the first step in the continuum. It's really just a GUI version of that command line script that already works. Except it's simpler for the person to interact with, right? Now another way that we could do this though, is let's say that the person running this script, I don't want to have to worry about them having Active Directory module installed in their computer. Well, here I could use implicit remoting. And so with implicit remoting, let me bring up my little demo here. I can connect to a server. In this case, I'm going to connect to the domain controller, import the commandlets that I want them to have access to. And I've already done this. Um, and then export that session. And then that builds a module, a PSS, a console file that I can then get put to the user and they can use that then to run their <coughs> commands. So when they're running get ad user, they are implicitly making a connection to the server and using remoting. As far as they're concerned, get ad users on their computer, but it's actually running in a remote session to the domain control. Now I still have to, you know, make sure they have the right permissions to do that. Um, let's see. Yep, I didn't put that in my demo here. All right, so let me see if I can get this to work here. Because I've, I've already run through this first part and I've already, it's already created the, um, the implicit remoting. 
I think I've done it on this computer. Oh, you know what? I forgot to copy that script over. I'll have to do that. Hear me. I copied all of the scripts from my scripts drive to the drive for my demos here. No, no, here, let me just copy this and I'll open up the file. I just didn't copy it to my demo directory here. Oh, never mind, I did copy it. It's the same. Oh yeah, so this is the the task. So the script that they can run will import the password change module. That's what I called when I created the implicit remoting. And some of the stuff, because of time, constra time constraints, I'm just going to assume you kind of know what it, re implicit remoting is. If not, we can talk about it later. But the rest of this code is all basically the same, except so if using get 80 user, I actually, when I imported my implicit module, I use a prefix, so it's not confused. And let's do. So there you can see it's creating the new session for the implicit remoting. Um, oh, let's change Jeremy Moskowitz. Some of you know Jeremy. There we go, so I just changed it, but I didn't have any of the Active Directory stuff on my computer. That was all built in to the implicit remote. <coughs> and if I needed to, I could have built a GUI on top of that. Basically I can use, and I've, I've, I've got some other GUI versions of that first one we looked at, all I did was just have to change some of the underlying code to what I'm showing you here in the console. So, implicit remoting is kind of cool, but I'm still kind of limited because that person had to have the right credentials. <coughs> a way around that is to set up a delegated endpoint. Now we're getting a little more complicated. So I can create a session configuration on the server and say, hey, when you run these commands, I want you to run it under this credential. So the person making the connection and running the commands that I give them, they have no idea who they're running under, they don't really care, it just gets the job done. So I can give a delegated endpoint to a non-admin, but they can still run commands that I specify in and administrative context. Eventually, GIA makes this even easier, and we'll, we'll get to that. This is the world that we kind of had before GIA came about. <clears throat> and I've already set this up, uh, but this is the code that I use to generate this. So I'm going to create my session con configuration file and store it on my file server. And this is the data that I need to create my delegated Active Directory endpoint. Now for this particular endpoint, I'm gonna use full language mode. I'm specifying what command list I want to have visible. I'm specifying that I need the Active Directory module. I then create that session configuration file. And I should be able to test it because it should already exist and oh, because that server has not started. That's fine, we don't need that server. You then need to register it on the server that you want to create that endpoint. And I have already done that. And we can show that here. 
if I run book command, let's just run this down here. I commented out because I didn't want you to run it as part of the, the whole script. So on my domain controller, I actually, there's the endpoint. So it runs as administrator, and it's limited as to what they can run. Do you have a question? Yeah. Why domain controller only? Why well, for this particular case, it made it easier because I need to change Active Directory user account. And if I try to go to another computer, then I'm in a second hop issue. It just complicated things. Remember, this is all proof of concept. So a lot depends, obviously, right, on the task that you want to achieve. In my case, because I need to change an Active Directory user account, it was just as easy to create an endpoint on the uh, domain controller. Now, what I didn't really mention here is the permission. I can limit who can even access this endpoint. And I think, oh yeah, so I've got here that the help desk. So unless you are a member of the help desk group, you can't even, or administrators, you can't even access this endpoint. So it's not like this endpoint is hanging out there waiting for someone to connect to. You still have to have the right credentials. So I can have, you know, my help desk admin, not a full blown domain administrator, but they're a member of the help desk group. And so they can connect to this endpoint and do what they need to do to change the user's password without having the keys of the kingdom. How do you trace the actions back? Oh, we'll, talk, we'll be talking about that tomorrow. Yeah. We'll be talking about that tomorrow. Um, in this particular case, because we're changing objects in Active Directory, that you probably have that auditing turned on anyway. But that certainly comes back to the, the planning phase. What am I delegating? Who am I delegating to? What are my auditing logging requirements? So you have to, and that's all going to vary, yeah. right, on whatever task you have. Guys, who was it that actually made the change when they're all logged into one anyway? Well, the help that if you were to look at the connection, it's going to still show you uh, as a member of the help desk. But, but you're right, the actual change for Active Directory will probably show the administrator. Yeah. Right. Um, but we're, we're delegating. <coughs> so it, it depends on what you want to what your trade-off is. And, and what you'll also see is when the user connects to this session, the WinRM, the PowerShell remoting log, does show the person who actually connected. And then you could use that to coordinate what actions happened during their connection time. Yeah, there are lots of different ways that you can do this. Again, it depends on what it is that you need to, what you want to delegate. So you could, with, with delegation, what I ended up trying originally was to put basically my delegated AD <coughs> task script that I showed you at the very beginning, putting it on the server. And so the user, I'd have to train them to say, yes, enter PS session, connect to the delegated AD endpoint, and then go ahead and run the same delegated task, whatever the, the script is. Yeah. Can you, can you set up a uh, PowerShell web? access as, as a delegated endpoint? Could you combine those two things? I believe, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah yes, yes you can. Um, in PWA then you'd have to specify the endpoint. Yeah. I think it's under the advanced settings you can specify what endpoint you, you want to connect to. Once again, it comes down to who's going to be doing this. I mean, that requires a certain level of expertise some sophistication on understanding PowerShell and endpoints or training on your part. So to make that even easier, you could build again a GUI. So I have here delegated endpoint two, which is gonna bring up the same type of GUI. All I changed here in the form So up at the beginning, I defined some variables. So there I defined my uh, endpoint, which I think I might have a different name there. And then 
in this particular case for PowerShell Studio, I'm able to use this, um, the load event. So even as the form is loading, I go ahead and create a session to that server, to that endpoint. So that when the user runs the script, or I, in this case I built it as an executable, let's see if this will work. Let's reset password two. Uh, okay, I don't know why you blinked there. There's two running. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wonder if I hit something twice. I probably should put something in the title so I knew which one I was running. Let's, let's close this one. Let's try one more time. Maybe I hit enter too many times. Okay. Uh, yeah, I. Yeah, I'm not sure. I may my keyboard or something may be funky. Uh, let's try. The console had your focus on you. Oh, uh, that could be. So well, that was much faster. All right, so let's change Shannon's password. Doesn't matter what it is. Click update. There. That's what I was waiting. That was much faster too. Because all that happened, all that Active Directory stuff happened on the domain controller, not on my computer waiting for communication back and forth. So again, I built the executable I could hand off to someone, say double click this, put in some portion, you know, this will take you five minutes to train them on how to use this form, and you're done. But yeah, you need some time to set up and test the endpoint and stuff ahead of time, but now all of this is running on top of that delegated restricted endpoint. And you could do that now in PowerShell version three. Questions? Someone started, I heard a consonant. So the next logical step then is GIA. Now GIA is a really cool technology that makes a lot of the delegating stuff I just showed you even easier. And it's all done with DSC. GIA is still very much a work in progress. We're still in the very early days of GIA. I think it's going to be a really fantastic tool for us as IT pros to do a lot of the stuff I'm showing you. What I'm going to show you now works with some caveats. I had some issues because there are uh, some things you got to deal with. Anyone here work with GIA? No one. All right. Um, with GIA, you can define basically a restricted endpoint and it will dynamically build uh, like a set of proxy functions where you can limit what you want people to have access to and it will also run under a specific credential so you don't have to worry about any of that. And it sets all of this up for you automatically. So if you look at the documentation for GIA list right now, you can use a CSV file. I'm not even sure if my CSV file is correct. I was going to show you in a moment, it really doesn't matter. Where I can specify what command lists I want to <laughs> make available and what parameters. So you can totally limit what someone has access to. So with GIA, what I ended up doing was build a configuration. So I in, import the XGIA module. I need to build the, you build, with GIA you build a toolkit and you build an endpoint. The Endpoint is what people are going to connect to, like we do with my remoting piece. And then the toolkit is what commands I want them to have access to. And so in this case, I'm dynamically building those commands from that CSV file, which is kind of cool. I then push that, and I've already pushed this configuration again to my domain controller. Again, you could do this to another server, a non-domain controller, but then you've got second hop issues. If you want to go down the cred SSP route, you can. I decided to take the path of least resistance and just do it on the domain controller for the sake of my demonstration. So if I look at the configuration endpoints on my domain controller, I should see there's my GIA AD. And I can even enter PS session. 
So I'm now connecting interactively, specifying this, this GIA endpoint. And you can see this running as this JSA GAD user. GIA set that up for me automatically. I didn't have to deal with any of that. So did you fudge the GIA module to make that Yeah, work? I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. <laughs> so these are the commands that I have available to me in this session. Now I had to add some because I needed them in my script or the, at least the, the process that I was following. But I could then run get AD user so I can find users. It all kind of works. It's kind of a pain because I still have to have some partial knowledge of what to type. Oop. Exit PS session. But some things won't work. Um, trying to save stuff to a variable because I'm in a, I'm not in full language mode, you really, it's not easy to use. And that's by design. So instead, you can do is I can create a session, convert, I can convert the variable, convert the string outside of my session and then pass it in as a value. Again, this would be something if you wanted someone to do in a script. So I'm just using invoke command. So this part here, this, this filter is built dynamically, but that dollar using SAM is coming from my computer. So I, I'm getting around the variable limitation in GIA. All of that will work or let's come back. I can also do this, this through a GUI. So I built one other version of the form that connects to, it's really not too much different than the previous one. I said to change my endpoint and I also had to change, I still create the session. Now down here, I did have to do that same type of funky logic to build variables and to find them on my machine and then just use them to construct the command that I want to run remotely. Because I can't create the variable remotely. That's fine. I don't need to. I can def define it here and then just reference it. That's now, pretty clever. Dollar using inside of the variable self-expression inside of single quotes inside of double quotes. Yeah, you like that. That huh? is amazing right there. <laughs> <laughs> Worth the price of admission, right? Right. Now, uh, what Ashley did, what Ashley <coughs> mentioned is when you build GIA and it builds that toolkit, it will build a module file that will build, dynamically build a set of proxy functions. Well, it turns out there is, let's call it a bug. A feature. It's, a feature. It's a well, I know I thought about calling it a feature. It's an undocumented feature. An undocumented feature. It's, it's designed for local, so it's, it's a design limitation. <laughs> yes. Um, and I have to see if I have that handy. When you build a proxy function for one of the Active Directory commandlets, it won't work. It fails to get to find, to find any of the parameters. So what I had to do was I actually had to manually construct the proxy functions for those Active Directory pieces. The pain, I don't, I have no idea why, why? Why is that a problem? <laughs> what, what is so special about the Active Directory command list that they won't, that I can't get command <coughs> metadata? That's a different problem than I was trying to solve. Oh, yeah, if you were to run the, the GEO DSC and you look at the underlying PSM1 that it creates, you would see like my get AD user even though I'm saying I want you to use these parameters, it will not generate the proxy function. Hmm. It'll, gen well, it'll generate it, but it'll have no parameters. The one thing that surprised me was saying dash in front of the parameter names. I don't know if that's what you need to do. Oh, in creating the... The CSV. In the CSV. I, I might go back and try that again. But no, because I think I tried... My, I got a little function that automatically generates proxy functions. Well, here, let's try it real quickly. And we can tell if this is a, an issue with GIA.
No. So that little function, that function that I wrote, that basically builds a proxy function, just, all you have to do is just give it a name. See that param does not get defined. So there's something with the Active Directory commandlets that they refuse to expose <coughs> their command metadata. So all I, what I had to do was go in here in the param section and manually put in those parameters like you would any other function. Send me a repro. Send me a repro and I'll exploit it. Okay. Question. Can you do multiple sessions to different type of boxes with multiple geo configurations? Like, I want to hit an exchange and a link pull. At the same yeah. Time, and fall to an AD. Probably. I mean, the thing with Gia. Are you talking about like in one management yeah. delegated tool? Yeah, yeah you somehow you'd have to keep track of all of that. Sure. But then, and then you'd then have to have some sort of logic to say, you know, if this connection fails, what happens? Um, I don't see why that wouldn't be possible. Um, a lot of the GIA stuff is still kind of in flux. They're, they're still <laughs> like that. <laughs> but I mean, GIA eventually, if you want to do delegation, again, start with a task that is simple. You don't want to give someone an incredibly complex thing. Usually we're delegating some small, simple task, offload some of my workload build a PowerShell function or script, something that works directly from the console. If you need to build a GUI, fine, then build a GUI, but you, are, you just build it on top of that tool that you've already built. You have to decide, okay, at what point in the continuum that Jeff showed me do I need to be on? Can I get by with just, oh yeah, here's the script and here's how you, here's how you run it, or Am I in such a high security environment for whatever reason that, but yeah, I need to be the most locked down GIA way that I can go? Questions? Wow, I did okay on time. GIA goes down to four, right? You did four? No, uh, GIA requires five. Does require five. Um, yeah, it requires five. The, up until Gia, everything he was showing around delegated endpoints and, and stuff, yeah. that's the 2.0. When you get the run as kind of switch of context, that's 3.0. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> bringing in Gia in the toolkit is 5.0. Yeah, so certainly a lot of the stuff in this continuum will also depend upon where are you at in your organization with what versions of PowerShell will you be running and supporting. So the, the late, I mean, obviously if you can run PowerShell 5 with server 2012 R2, that's the way to go. Now, now even though the GIA stuff, you can still have a client running Windows 7 and PowerShell 3, because they can still do, actually probably even PowerShell 2 even for the remoting piece, because at, at that point, once they're doing remoting, it doesn't matter really what they have on, they can have next to nothing on their computer. They just have to have PowerShell remoting enabled and name resolution, all that normal stuff. And the initial credential to connect to the endpoint. I kind of glossed over some of that, but with these endpoints, you can say you must be a member of this group in order to access. Otherwise, you're turned away. Other questions? Does GIA expose, can you expose non PowerShell commands? <coughs> Yes, you can. You can. There, there is some. There is information in the documentation, at least as, as it exists now, where you can say, "I want to be able to delegate uh, IP config," yeah. and include that as a valid command. But basically, with GIA, if it's not in the toolkit, they can't run it. But yes, you can do. But it's all command. It's all console at that point. Now you can build a GUI to maybe. Pull Maybe they're running in your script, in your GUI script, that command is running remotely and then you're pulling the information back and surfacing it in your GUI. That's perfectly fine. But remember, everything's running in a remoting session at that point. And another capability you also have is you can expose your own functions. 
So if, if, for example, SQL, you wanted to do some stuff with SMO or some other .NET namespace or some kind of scripting, you can still expose that as a, as a task based on a function, and that's still all the person can, can run. Now tell them where they can get the GIA guide. I'm sorry? Tell them where they can get that guide. And when you download the resource kit, there's a GIA documentation folder. It's got that guide. Yeah, the GIA stuff is, I think it's on the PowerShell gallery. It's also, I yeah. think, a... a um, it's just download. on the download site. Yeah. Yeah. If so you just do a search for, you know, GIA download, you sh you'll get the GIA module, you'll get a PowerPoint presentation that Jeffrey Snover did, a kind of a white paper version of that, some examples. So, so it's certainly worth playing with. So thinking grand scheme going forward is you need that, that toolkit file, the CSV, that, that well, you, you can build to control what is available in GIA. You can, and then you or can you can do it in the module. That, when, when you build your configuration for the GIA toolkit, you can hard code those things in if you want. Well, I'm uh, thinking you want to make it dynamic. So, hey, I want to give access to this, and then three months from now, I need to add more access to Right, so then you can just update the CSV, repopulate, and, or push yeah. out a new version of the configuration. Yeah. Through DSC. Through DSC. So if, if you haven't picked up. DSC? I'm sorry? Is that, would, that, would that be required to you know, be deploying it through DSC? Yeah, yeah, this is all really, yeah, this is DSC. So if you haven't picked up on the fact that you should be learning and using DSC, you have been sleeping today. <laughs> well, there's just not some other mechanisms, because you can no. do the whole, you know, PS, you know um, remote session. I mean, I mean every, at the end of the day, what I'm in, ending up with is the same type of thing that I used to be able to do manually. It was just a little more complicated. This is much more dynamic, um, takes away a lot of the grunt work, and because it's DSC, I can make sure that that endpoint is always configured the way I want it to be. So I have to worry about Lee coming along and screwing it up. <laughs> Known to do that once or twice. Yeah. <coughs> Question. Yeah. So when an admin connects to that endpoint, and it doesn't have to be an admin. No, someone who has someone who has permissions. I just want to make that clear. So when I'm the admin, I'm testing this thing with my admin access. Uh, when I connect to the endpoint, do I also see the limited yes. variables? Yes. Yes. Whoever connects to that endpoint is limited to whatever is in that endpoint. Even though I have full access to the server and everything. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. That's that's one of the things about the distinction here on endpoints, so that. These are alternate endpoints. You can still connect to the regular Microsoft.PowerShell endpoint, right. and then you're just you. And so the people who have been given delegated access won't be able to connect to the regular endpoint. They'll only be able to connect up to the GEO one. Yeah, and that, that was the whole purpose of this is, you know, Jeffrey Snover's talk about security in a post-Snowden Snowden world right. is, yeah, you're a domain admin, but I don't want you to have access to everything. Or maybe you're an admin with certain elevated privileges, but you know what? I'm only going to trust you to do X, Y, and Z so I can delegate. Right. Now, certainly someone has to have the right power and authority and permission to set this all up in the first place. And these commands that you put in CSV file have to be in some module, or it'll take a long snap and so like exchange snap in? Uh, module. I don't believe any of this will work with anything that's in a snap in. Uh, and the, yeah, that could. I have not tried the most. Everything now, hopefully, is still in modules, and so snap-ins are should be right fading away. Yes. That's yeah, the plan. The one thing about using uh, modules versus snap-ins is that PowerShell includes auto importing of modules. It doesn't include auto importing of snap-ins. So the, the answer is you need to import it beforehand. Otherwise, it just won't be there. And then you can still apply permissions onto it. It's easier if everything's just in a module. And I'm all about the easy. Not so much about the base, but all about the easy. You've got to convince the vendors to convert well, over. You're right. And that's it's like they, your, it that's, once, they don't want to come back and touch it. That's all of your job, is if you have got vendors that are giving you PowerShell solutions that are, let's say, suboptimal, <laughs> you need to push back and say, what are you doing? Where's verb dash noun? Where's the help documentation? Where are the examples? Where's the provider? How, how come this is in a snap-in and not a module? So that's up to, we ran into this with PowerShell in the early years. 
when some of the vendors first started going and they would say, oh yeah, we got PowerShell and people would look and go, wait, what's that? You know, you're, you're not getting it. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're counting, and um, we, I mean the community, have to look, work with your vendors and say, no, you're doing it wrong. All right, other questions? Otherwise, I'll draw out your evals. I'll be around here trying to put everything away. Time's up. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you.